Welcome to Dispatches from the Front with Brian Gerrish from UK Column. And uh, in this edition of uh, Dispatches, we're going to be looking at the appalling case of Brian and Janice Doherty, who had their children removed from them by the state because they dared to report a man who offered to pay a huge sum of money for their son so that he could abuse him. Before we hear from the parents themselves, I'm going to discuss the case with uh, David Scott from Northern Exposure, who recently was able to visit Brian and Janice at their location and learn for himself what had actually taken place. David, you've recently met and had a quite incredible discussion with a young couple, Janice and Brian Doherty, and you've recently posted an article on UK Column, The Brutal Protection of Paedophiles. And what's to follow is an audio interview that you conducted uh, recently with um, Brian and Janice, mum and dad, and it's a story about their family and what's happened to their children. But why should people um, read your article? Why should people give up 45 minutes of their time to listen to what this young couple have to say? Well, the story is um, it, it is one which one would hope would be incredible, but it, it, it is credible, it is believable. They're a the very believable and credible couple. And it's their uh, ordinary down-to-earth um, attitude and, and care for one another and, and care for the children that, that shone out for me during the interview. So you have this um, um, very personal, very well-educated young couple bringing up the young family and looking to carry on their the, the lives, you know, get employment and get on in life. And um, they are approached by a paedophile. They're approached by a paedophile who is so confident that he is untouchable that he can come up to them in broad daylight and offer them £25,000 for access to their son. And the story then follows their fight to protect their children, firstly. And then their fight to maintain their family as the um, power of the state uh, bears down upon them, not upon the paedophile, but upon the family who reported this attempt at, at, at grossly criminal uh, activity. Uh, they, have, they have found themselves fighting... Um, the state, in fact, fighting three states because this story straddles Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. David, I, I, of course, have listened to all of the interviews and um, what I will say is that I found the story deeply disturbing um, because essentially it's, it's like the plot of a horror film. And at one point, the, the parents say, when you discover that you cannot go to the police, you cannot trust the police, then who do you turn to for help? And the, the implications for every single parent, whether they're in Scotland, Ireland, UK, Wales, wherever it is, the implications of events around this couple are truly staggering. They, they are. Um... The couple um, have reported some some fine individuals who strangers who have who have helped them who have stood by them who have bailed them out who have literally fed them when they were starving. Um, but when they went to the authorities, the there have been one or two noticeable notable exceptions who who have been straight and have been honest. But the general um, response has been either to ignore their cries for help or um, to actually um, target the family, target the Doherty's um, for all of the, um, the the pain the might of the state can bring. Yes, with with a an, a particularly 
uh, brutal, you've used that word, brutal vindictiveness. Um, not just a, a question that they were brushed off and ignored by the, the state. They've been pursued with this very, very um, brutal, uh, vicious approach. And uh, that is one of the key things that uh, I think brings home the seriousness of this case. Many other cases, of course, utterly horrific in children have been taken away and indeed abused. But there is something about this case that brings um, so many facets of those other cases together. Yes. What? Yes. I, and and the when the state is targeting people in this way, it's targeting first of all the children. It it, it hits it hits at people where they are weakest. So it targets the children, yeah. which has a, a a particular cruelty to it. Yeah. And um, it then targets their mental health because if if you can be um, locked away, and and um, a claim can be made that you are um, not um, uh, rational. Yeah. Then everything you say can be ignored. Uh, all of your rights can be removed, and there is no need to have anything like a court, uh, or have your day in court, or have your case made. It's much more under the radar, and it is. Um, reminiscent of uh, of stories that you and I, Brian, would have been familiar with from the 60s and 70s of, uh, of totalitarian regimes, of communist regimes. Yes. Um, of, of the worst abuses of state power. Yeah. Well, at that point, we, we will, we will um, move on to play this uh, part interview. This is number one of ten, and we're going to say to people... Uh, please listen all the way through. I'm sure once once you hear this first uh, interview that David has done, you will want to follow on and we will be producing these um, and making them available as part of uh, Dispatches from the Front by UK Column. So here we are. This is uh, David interviewing Janice and Brian Doherty as they tell their amazing story. My name is David Scott of Northern Exposure. I'm sitting down tonight with Janice and Brian Doherty. Uh, we're going to be talking about their experiences with the Scottish state and uh, with their fight to protect their, their children uh, from abuse and um, the role of the state in, uh, rather than supporting them in that fight and actually being part of, of the abuse itself and supporting the abusers who are in high places and who have power and influence. Uh, but before we get to these deeper matters, uh, I'll take a few minutes to, to introduce uh, Janice and Brian uh, to the listeners so you can understand the nature of the, the people they are and how uh, events such as uh, the ones we're about to describe can happen to, to any of us. They are random in their nature. And um, no matter how uh, established, um, well-educated, um, law-abiding, uh, or in any way conventional you might be, these things can come to your door um, simply if you happen to run across the wrong people at the wrong time. Uh, so I'd like to start, um, uh, uh, Brian and Janice, uh, with uh, just could you tell me um, how you two met, how you became a couple? Um, hi, David. We, we met at teacher training college um, 16 years ago now. Um, we were both at teacher training at the same time. We went to Glasgow University at the same time, but we didn't meet. Um, my wife was studying English language and literature. I was studying classics and history at Glasgow University between... I was a year older than you, so I was 92 and you were 93. Um, but approximately at the same time, we met at teacher training from the year 2000. And 2000. 2000. And we clicked, I suppose, in the canteen and various places, and then we were on a placement together. A school placement in a very tough school in Glasgow. St. Rocks. So it was my excuse to invite my wife out for a few drinks and, and a coffee and 
we got to know each other and we've been together since. So from uh, the roughest, toughest school in Glasgow, um, where where did you head from there? Um, We then... uh, well, we, spent we had a, a flat in Hindland in the West End. Yeah. And um, I had I had our first daughter, Alexandra, while you were teaching in... Um, Alexandra came along shortly afterwards, um, and I was teaching in Glasgow schools, in our city Glasgow schools, from John Paul Academy in Mary Hill to Hindland Secondary, just around the corner from us. Um finally to Bishop Briggs where I was working in a school called Thomas Muir High School as principal teacher of history um, and then we went to France yes then we a year, moved over to France a year in the south of France um, which was great the economy wasn't so great then but the, the year was great for for everything really for for life and and then we went to Singapore where I was headhunted to lecture in a sort of top junior college they call it um, where I was lecturing history um, 20th century history and politics at a school um, where you apply to the ministry and then you're appointed to a school so I was working in a school called Hua Chong um, which is a huge school in South East Asia and Singapore and we spent some time there which was um, an experience a very different experience to teaching in the UK and we came back Quite to... a contrast from France, which was laid back, to Singapore, which was constantly busy and non Yeah, I think I worked about 18 hours a day in Singapore. The pay was good and the lifestyle was very good in a way, but we didn't really see much of each other, I suppose. <laughs> you were too busy, so um, I thought it was time to... To come back. So we... So you came, so you came back to, to Scotland? We came back to Scotland. Um, to Perth, where to Perth, I was from. Where Janice was from originally. And... Um, um, I taught in schools in Perth before moving up to Aberdeenshire um, for another position. Moved up to Aberdeenshire in 2014. Okay, and by this time the family had, had grown a bit. It wasn't just Alexandra anymore. That's right. Um, we had Sebastian, um, who was seven, seven years younger than Alex, yeah. and then Charlotte. Um, Sebastian was born in 2009, then Charlotte in 2010. <laughs> And then I was pregnant with Christian, who was... Um, Christian was born in 2014. Okay, so you came back to Scotland and you, you're overflowing with children. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and uh, I suppose we we got we had itchy feet, we wanted to get away, and uh, we just fancied life abroad. For, and, uh, and after being a full-time mother for five years, I decided I didn't really want a job, so I thought I'd have some more children. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... <laughs> We started doing a bit of writing abroad and just writing down the differences in culture and experiences and so on and just funny stories and then came back and extent, you know, set up camp and had more of a family. Um, and and your job in Singapore, that was that was actually quite high level. That was a managerial or, or a, a leadership role in, in the institution you had there? Yeah, it was I was a I was Head of history in Scotland, and then they recruit you based on your experiences. So you don't apply to a school like here; it's based on your previous experiences. So um, we got the interview in London, and then um, went to Singapore, where they give you another interview, and then tell you what school you're going to. And this school was the school for the political class and the sort of business class. So the faculty I worked in was called the humanities faculty. And ninety nine percent of their kids all went to Oxbridge, MIT, Harvard, Princeton. It was a high flying kids, very fast tracked kids. You know, it was higher than ninety nine percent all went to these schools. So it was a very high level lecturing where you did two hour lectures to different. Um, in my case, I was teaching a lecturing history and working in the high school in the morning and then working in the boarding school in the evening. So it was very Singaporean and in terms of time. But it was a very good job, it was a very good position, very well paid, um, just not very good for family. So we came back in 2008, I think it was, yeah. And then um, career-wise in Perth, that, that, that wasn't the story in Perth, you weren't? No, um, career-wise in Perth, it was 
it was a kind of quite the opposite. I was just doing sort of general or long long term supply in usually my subjects. Um, and I didn't really feel it was going anywhere in particular. I felt like I was overqualified and um, not really enjoying it as much, I think, because it was, you know, it was like being a deputy head and going back to doing classroom general teaching without the challenge. Um, so I did a business course and then I was a political candidate in the, for election in 2011. I don't know why I'm laughing. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was for the Holyrood election in 2011. My wife was my campaign manager and my election agent. And uh, we've always been a close team, Janice and I, and her advice has been invaluable. Um, her nature is much quieter than mine, but her intelligence is much higher than mine. That's just a general statement of fact. Although I'm a much more of an extrovert, um, my wife is judgment is very good, um, and uh, we make a good team. So we did that together, and despite it being, shall we say, Dundee, which is not so conservative, it was a good ex- good, experience. <laughs> a good experience. And actually, some of the people who <laughs> who, would, who were most convinced were people who had a very open mind and they were of small backgrounds. You know, just people like I remember school janitors and dinner ladies at one school tell me they would vote conservatives and you know just because of general chat and uh, and people you would meet giving out leaflets you, you could have a bit of banter with and a laugh with not based on policies but based on people based on humour um, and based on people seeing that you were a normal person so it was very enjoyable um, the big campaign then was over a biomass plant which was being built a recycling, not really recycling plant in in the west of Dundee, sorry, east of Dundee, in a residential area. Um, but it was a good experience, and we then moved up to Aberdeen, I suppose. Yeah. So, so to to uh, follow your career and get get a career that was more dynamic than you were able to achieve. I, in yeah, most you, definitely. Yeah. You, you moved north. It's not quite Singapore, but it was another big a big change. Given the fact at that point it was what three children and a bump. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Yes. It was more important to get... The economy wasn't so good when we came back and it was more important to get a stability, I suppose. Um, and as I say, I was doing this Chartered Management Institute course, um, which seems a very long time ago now. But um, So yeah, the idea was stability and um, onwards and upwards. Okay. Like any other so that time. took you to Fraserburgh Academy? That's right, yep. Fraserburgh in 2014. Um, and then uh, that's where the story gets more strange uh, mm. because uh, you had obviously to find accommodation. So where, where did that take you? It took us to um, the estate of a Viscount um, uh, just outside Fraserburgh. Um, it was between sort of equidistant between Fraserburgh and Peterhead. Literally, you could not... It was so difficult to find. Um, it was perfect for us because although the house was a wee bit small it was just a two bedroom cottage it was perfect because the garden was huge it was a lovely summer and our son Sebastian has autism and part of that condition is uh, a noise hypersensitivity so he um, we went there to view the house and the garden was massive and um, it was very 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 quiet I mean it was a single track um, drive outside the house and you, it was very, very difficult to find. It was very quiet from the point of view of peace because my son suffers noise like pain. So a, a motorcycle or a lorry actually hurts him. And he's a natural athlete. So we thought it would be a nice house for the children. It was only 10 minutes from my school. It seemed to tick all the boxes in terms of family orientated. But we didn't know what lay beneath. Uh, we didn't know what was happening round about until we went to live there. It seemed on the surface idyllic. Um, it seemed perfect and safe. It turned out to be none of these things. Okay, so when when did you first? When was that first um, brought home to you? It was brought home probably about a month, maybe a slightly more than a month. We moved there beginning of June, and there was only two neighbours. One was the Viscount Viscount Petersham, and the other neighbour was a man called Alan Lowe. and we didn't know either men 
but the only thing we did know was that both men professed a dislike of each other and a dis... not really... They, 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 knew, kind of they didn't really know each other and yeah. they didn't really like each other very much. Yep. And um, when Alan Lowe became aware, we didn't see much of this man. They were both 47 years of age and all we knew about Alan Lowe was that he shared his home with two teenage boys that he was in a relationship with. We didn't know anything about him, and he was just we were just on nodding terms. Um, one day, he invited himself over to the garden when I was in the garden, and uh, it was a summer. And he started asking me questions about my son. He'd already shown a peaked interest in my son, and I just thought he was being friendly. And there was nothing much to there was nothing really much to the conversation because we didn't know each other. On this occasion, he made demands and. He started, when he found out my son was autistic and he had speech learning um, and communication problems, he became very interested in a heightened sense and asked me lots of questions. He then made, in a very most incredible and a very strange um, statement, he said to me, I'll give you £25,000 for your son. You give me your boy and I'll give you £25,000. You can do with what you want. I says, excuse me, he says, you give me your boy, I want access to that boy. I says, that's my son you're talking about. He says, I want that boy. I've taken care of a boy before. You bring your son to me on a Friday night and I'll give you 25 grand. So I told him to stay away from my son and he repeated it. And he says, you won't say no to me. And I said to him, you stay away from my son, you get away from me, you get away from my family, get out of this garden, don't you dare come near my children. And he started, he repeated the same thing over, which was, you. he kept repeating over and over, you won't say no to me, you'll give me access. His word was access to your son. And when he came over um, to the garden, he was slightly inebriated, but not drunk, not so that he wouldn't be aware of what he was saying. Not so that he wouldn't be aware of what he was demanding. And and being slightly inebriated, was that usual for him or unusual? Well, we've he, seen him driving his van with a beer bottle in his hands on a quite quite a few occasions. Yeah, we saw him drive past because we our, the cottage was a gatehouse cottage and it was beside the road, so he usually drove his van, his builder's or gardening van, with a trailer and it rattled along this country road. So we'd see him coming over, there was a little humpback bridge. As I say, it looked idyllic, but what lay beneath was something different. But you'd hear his van, and he used to drive the van quite fast. And we'd see him with a, a beer bottle, we'd have to slow down to go over the bridge and turn the corner. And usually at the end of the day, he'd have a beer bottle swinging, swinging the beer bottle. Um, he was a strange character, he, was a, he had three fingers missing, he openly smoked dope, you could smell it as he walked past. He openly drunk and uh, drive, drive his vehicle. Um, he was a very unusual character, just in his mannerisms and his makeup. But it wasn't until this day when he offered the money for my son that we realised. And, okay. and his reaction to being told to go away in no uncertain terms was was one of of confidence that that he could force the issue. Was that? It was a very a fair summary. Yeah, it was a, it was a v- extremely. I don't know if you know what I mean, but it was one of these um, exchanges where afterwards you, you went away and you were so shocked by what was just said that you couldn't actually believe that he just said what he said. No normal person would walk up to someone and say, "I'll give you twenty five thousand for your son," and he acted so confident, like he was so protected, that he could actually walk up to a relative stranger and offer this money. And I was the only way I could describe it was. I walked away and I thought, did that, did that just happen? And I knew it happened, but it, it was so shocking. And I, the way I reacted was, at the time, disbelief, you know? But at the same time, and his, his, his repeated statement was, you won't say no to me. You give me access to that boy. I want access to the boy. You, you won't the boy. The, that, bo- boy. The, that boy, the boy, you won't say no to me. And I, I thought, why would, why would I not say no to you? Well, you stay away from my child, you. 
perfect, you know, you, you know, get away from my, my, my family. And it was just totally, I, I, I came in, I remember talking about it with my wife and my wife, because it was the summer, was talking to her daughter, it was maybe about nine-ish, nine o'clock, and I couldn't talk about it immediately because my daughter was present. And Jana said later, she, later that she could see me in a state of bit shock. <laughs> it's the only way to describe it because I was yeah. kind of pacing in the living room, looking out the window, thinking, you know, guys, off his, you know, you know, what, what, and what planet is that normal? But he seemed to think it was normal, and it was after that there was a lot of an, so it was became quite threatening because at night after that he made a lot of threats. I, I didn't mention this, but after it, he made a lot of threats um, to what, me. What sort of threats? Um, threats against. Myself primarily that he that um, I'd regret it and uh, you know threats of physical violence or worse than physical violence. He didn't elaborate. He just he just said you 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 know you, you'll regret it and you you better watch it and things like that. And, um, it was all um, very very odd, extremely odd. Um, I mean, people say things are odd and shocking, but this was weird. Twisted, and as Janice was um, was going to say, as the next couple of weeks there was just an increased level of violence and petty vandalism, and then not so petty, and it increased from attacking the cars to breaking into the house. There was also noises at night after we, you know, put the lights out. We could hear people outside, and they weren't trying to be quiet. They were actually trying to make themselves heard. And because it was in the middle of nowhere, there was no street lights. So at night it was pitch black. It's pitch black. There was and, nothing out there. And you could hear people outside. And of course, by the time if you put the lights on or if you go outside with a torch or whatever, the people have gone. There were stone chips around the house, so you could hear men at least. Yeah, talking or walking or, and, and walking you know, around the house. Thumps and there were scrapes on the cars. There was um, dead birds and small animals put outside the small log cabin in the garden where the children played. Where the children were playing. Then there was um, the big one where initially, when I was speaking to Janice with this, we thought we're just going to move. We're just going to move house. Um, and we didn't actually even consider reporting it to police to begin with. We just thought safety of our children. We have to get out of here. We've got to get. But going. it was after the intimidation and and you know all started and it kind of got out of control. The worst one was. Um, our son had a, a big Lightning McQueen toy car, mm. which he used to play with outside all the time. But he didn't. He just left it in the garden at night when it was time to come in. He'd just leave it there. And then there was one morning when um, it had been placed inside the, the, the greenhouse. And we weren't aware of this at the time, but he was wanting his toy car. But he has a fear of enclosed spaces. He won't go into. He wouldn't go into the greenhouse. He just wouldn't dream of it. So he was making a fuss and wanting his car. And it was his wee sister Lottie who was with him at the time. And so she went to get the toy car out of the greenhouse and the three panes from the glass door fell on top of her. And it was an absolute miracle because they didn't break and it, it couldn't, she was, she was only little, they could have, it could have killed her. It could have been disastrous, but as it was, she just got minor cuts. So when this happened, um, well, I was inside, you and Alex were outside at the time, and you went, to, obviously, to get her straight away, and, and the clips hold, that held that were supposed to, obviously, hold the glass panes in place had all been taken out and, and put in a flower pot. Um, and, uh, and stones were put on the runners and, to cause this. And little stones being placed along the runner so that when the door was pushed, it would fall forwards, and also the top sealant had been taken out and was just lying on the ground. So it had clearly been rigged and that was on for, the, for Seb, because it was his toy car. It was his car. But as it happened... He had this large plastic like McQueen and he put it, or the guy, Lo, I assume, or someone, one of his friends put it inside for this to, to cause him an act, an act, a serious accident. It was on that day I contacted... Viscount Petersham. National Crime Agency and Viscount Petersham. So what happened is, um, I remember that was the 4th of August because I've looked at that email a few times for various reasons. Um, based on this moron's dangerous attempt at my child I thought he's not just a deviant, he's a dangerous deviant and we were hoping to try and move but this was posing too serious a risk um, in the immediate sense we were watching our children in the garden, we were not letting them out of our sight but this was very very dangerous so um, in passing we were told by the Viscounts P his children were coming back from boarding school 
So at that point, I said to Janice, we should contact his contact him and tell him about this neighbour, tell him what he's about. So I emailed, first of all, was a contact to the National Crime Agency because they're supposed to deal with people like this. And in the second instance, I wrote a letter. I phoned up and made an appointment to see, ironically, to protect his children. I made an appointment to see him to tell him about this neighbour, this neighbour that he'd led us to believe he didn't know and didn't like. Um, in a very kind of, he said, oh, I, I don't really know that man and I don't, kind of, I don't pr- approve of him. That's how he introduced it when we went to view the house. Um, so I was told that he was out of the country till Friday. So I sent a letter to him. Um, our post was going missing a lot as well at this time. So I sent it recorded delivery. And, um, we were told that he would, we would meet him on the Friday. Friday was, I remember, the 8th of August and he was due to come down to the garden and meet with us. Instead, at the meeting time, the state agent from the, the factors who organised this house... They the, turned, the lease of the house. The, the, uh, a lady called Kerry from Brown and McRae showed up um, in his place. And we were a bit confused and so was she because she was told that she was there to meet with the Viscount's PA... Um, she was called Naomi called Naomi and we were told that he was going to come down just him and meet with us because for us this wasn't about the house this was about warning him about a dangerous neighbour so it was a very strange situation again another odd situation where Kerry was told that she was coming to meet with Naomi we were told that he was going to come down and meet with us and instead the estate agent showed up at the house but the Viscount didn't show so after half an hour... No, it was a lot more than that. It was more like an hour. After about an hour, we were sitting outside in the sunshine and he didn't show and he didn't show. Um, I phoned his house and spoke with his daughter who said that her father wasn't in and then the line went dead suddenly. And then a few minutes later, Naomi phoned from her mobile phone. Not Naomi, okay. Eh, sorry, Kerry phoned from her mobile phone and spoke with the daughter and then she said that her father would come down soon. Well, she was asking to speak to Naomi, but it turned out no, Naomi was off that day. Um, and so then she, yeah, then she was told that the, the Viscount would come down. That he would come down. So a long time after... At least another half hour. About an hour and a half after we'd arranged to meet him, he showed up, shoulders hunched, head bowed, head bowed and, and very uncomfortable and clearly didn't want to be there. And from the moment off in this meeting, he didn't want... Anything my wife or I had to say about what had transpired to be audible to the stage and Kerry. He kept trying to speak over us to begin with, and because um, he, he obviously didn't want this mentioned in front of Kerry, um, uh, why she'd been arranged been arranged in the first place was a bit of a mystery. To us. <laughs> but at one point, when when my husband and Viscount Peterson were talking, I turned to Kerry and told her that the neighbour had offered us money for her son and she gave the normal reaction which was she was whole shocked by that she thought that was appalling so at that point the Viscount um, he, um, stopped trying to, to you know to talk over us because he was kept too trying weak. to manage it and instead um, I was rather I'd taken aback because I thought what in meeting with him I was telling another father he had two young children a girl who was about eight sorry 13 or 12 and a boy about 8 and I thought that I was telling this father, father to father, this man's dangerous. And he's not only propositioned me for my son, but he's also attacking the house. And I was telling him as my landlord about what was happening in the house. He wasn't interested in that. What he said was, there's all sorts of people, it's pointless if you report this to the police. There's all sorts of people that are paedophiles, including in the clergy and in the police. It's a waste of time. At that point, I told him I'd already reported it to the National Crime Agency and I became angry. And he told us Alan, having told us before he barely knew Alan Lowe, he suddenly said that he was very good friends, friends with Alan Lowe. He told us before that he didn't know the man and didn't care for him, which was kind of a strange thing to say because if you don't like someone, you generally would have to know them. But in this occasion, he said that he was very good friends with him and that he could, he could vouch for him. And his arrogance was such that he thought that if he had just told us that he could vouch for him, that we would just go away and go, well, begging your pardon, your worship. And instead, I, I was confused by the whole situation because I couldn't understand. I hadn't placed together how this all fitted, how, how this all worked together. Then he threatened me and he said that, I suppose there's all sorts of services and social services that can deal with children and can deal with your children. 
and he threatened me with the police and social services that should we report this man to the police, he would get social services and the police onto my family. Could, could, could you say specifically how that threat was made? Specifically, um, when I mentioned the National Crime Agency, he got quite angry and he not only did he dig in about when I said, well, if you, you know, if you're not interested in this, I'm going to take it to the local police. I said, because this guy is dangerous and he's out, outside late at night and he dismissed that. Um, that there was not just him, but there was other men. He said, oh, that's just a phantom prowler. And uh, I said, look, you can believe what you want, but I can tell you that this guy is dangerous and what's happened here. And he said, it's pointless you complaining to the police. There's all sorts of paedophiles in the police and in the clergy. Um, and he said that um, if you if you go to the police, there's all sorts of services and social services that can deal with your children. And this was a not too very deep, real threat on my children. About so there's, a, there's a, a, a complete link there that reporting potential paedophile to the police will result in social services seizing your children. That was the threat he made, and he made it in almost as many words. Is that correct? That was um, exactly exactly what happened. The, I couldn't have been more taken aback. It was a... Uh, I think we both got rather cross, actually. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we both got rather cross with them. Um, and because um, I, I was, I was think, I couldn't, I, I was, we couldn't see <laughs> it why. It was not badly, so we say. Uh, the not, meeting did not come to <laughs> <all it did. laughs> it Didn't make any sense because I, I don't think there are any established etiquette rules on how you deal with that sort of <laughs> um, He actually, you, you, I can't. Oh, oh, and he told us that we were no longer um, desirable, desirable tenants. tenants. No longer so. And that was, um, it turned out that that was why Kerry was there because he said to her that the, the, um, there was too many of us in the house and um, he only knew about Sebastian. He'd only noticed Sebastian, Sebastian. Our, our, our disabled son. And Kerry knew about the other children, so she was put in an awkward position where he was saying to her, right, they've got too many children and they haven't told us, so they've got to be evicted. And she said, well, actually, we did know about them. Um, <laughs> and she couldn't, so, she, so it left him in a rather awkward position. Um, at that point, we said, well, we don't want to live here anyway we because don't we don't want to live next door to this man. Yeah. And he said, well, um, you just leave. You'll get your deposit back. And that's Which what happened instantly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and that Which was is, that. It was £750. So, I worked out we paid £3,750 over three months. We stayed there for three months <laughs> for a two-bedroom cottage and we paid £3,750 and lost most of our possessions. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we had to leave most of our... Anyway, um, it ended with you saying to him that, that you said you disgust me, and at that point I thought, you've just said that to a bike and we're in trouble here. <laughs> this is my and it ended very, um, he, he, he was still very hunched, he left with his shoulders very hunched over, um, he was very un- his tail between his legs actually. He was very unimpressive. Um. <laughs> And we'll find out as we talk through this further, you are absolutely right about being in trouble here. And we'll get to that just shortly. And that ends the first interview with Janice and uh, Brian Doherty. There will be a further nine serialised interviews by David Scott under the title of Dispatches. Look out for part two, which will be released in the next few days. Thank you.